John here. Let's look and see how we can program this uh, flash chip on the Z80 retro board. Okay, now I've got a FO10 here, and that's the one megabit sized one, which is 128 K bytes, right? Now the schematic was set up such that any one of these three chips will work. So if you can't get the FO10, get the 20 or the 30, or rather the 40, uh, which are just bigger sizes all right we don't even use all the all of the 128k in the small one right we'll just use less of the bigger ones if that's what they have in stock they don't cost that much so get whatever one the cheapest one you can get all right now let's take a look and see how we're supposed to program this thing so there's obviously the data sheet for the flash chip okay so we come through here tells you various things and how they're pinned out and what the pins are for, address bus, data bus, chip enable, output, and write enable. We talked a little bit about this when we were looking at the schematic and how the reset logic works and how the flash chip is hooked into the retro board in the first place. Bottom line is that you put an address on the address bus and you assert chip enable to be true, which is low, and then you can uh, assert output enable and coming out then of the data bus from the flash will be the data at the address that you gave it on the address bus. If you want to write data into the flash, let's make sure we're real clear on this. There is the writing of a byte into the flash chip itself. And then there's the programming of a byte into the flash. I'll try to differentiate and maintain my terminology here, right? So when we write a byte to the flash chip, we're sending a byte to the chip. That doesn't mean where I'm going with this is it doesn't mean that we've programmed that byte into the flash, okay? Because there's a two-way uh, uh, dialogue that takes place between the the uh, device that we're going to use to program the flash and the flash chip itself. In other words, we're going to be writing data into the flash chip and having a conversation with it in order to get it programmed, okay? So there's writing data into the flash, and there's programming a byte in the flash memory, all right? Uh, at the top level here, what we're looking at is asserting write enable and chip enable at the same time to send a byte into the flash chip, okay? To write a byte, not to program it necessarily. Okay. Now, how do we use these things to program them? Okay. So you scroll down here and, and like most data sheets, it gives you like 80 different ways to do something. We only care about one. So let's focus on the variation that I've decided to use in the code that I'm going to use. You can change it if you want and uh, experiment away. Now, they give you a little dialogue here about what it means to read. It's pretty straightforward. Because like I said, you assert chip enable and output enable at the same time. And whatever the address is that you have on the address bus, the data will come out of the flash that's been stored at that address. How do you program a byte? And this is the mode that we're going to use, one byte at a time. Uh, what happens is it says before programming, uh, you have to erase the sector of data in which you're going to program. All right, now I'm not going to do this sector erasing. I erase the whole chip. Then I program the bytes one at a time. It's easier, at least in my opinion, to erase the whole thing. That is then erasing all the sectors all at once. And then you can just come back and program one byte at a time. Uh, what does it say? Program operation is accomplished three steps. First step is, is a three byte load sequence. All right, so this is you, we're going to write three bytes into the chip in a very specific order and very specific uh, addresses, and a very you know that specific com combination of operations is what unlocks the chip so that we can write data into it. All right, it's simple; it just has to be done. Then the second step it says it load in a byte address and the data that you want to write into the flash memory, okay? So then it says what? During the uh, byte operation, the address is latched on the falling edge and so on, blah, blah, blah. We'll talk more about the which edges are doing what when we look at the waveform diagrams of the signals that come out of our software. Uh, it turns out they give you a lot of specifics in here in case you have a really tight timing system and you're really, you know, looking closely at everything. What we're going to do is a broadside of a barn. So we're going to put the address on the address bus, and then we're going to put the data on the data bus way before we're going to assert the chip enable and write enable, which we're going to do together. And it talks about whatever one is first or last and so on. They're going to happen at the same time for us. And then we're going to remove the chip enable and the write enable at the same time 
And after all that, we will remove the data and the address. So we're going to maximize the setup and hold time of the address and the data bus values. Okay. Now it says when you program it, it can take uh, up to 20 microseconds to complete. We're going to just assume they all take 20 microseconds. They have all kinds of stuff in here that talks about polling it so that you can, you know, program it really fast. It'll tell you when it's done. We're running so slow, all right, because of the I squared C bus and the Raspberry Pi code. It's not really the Raspberry Pi code that's slow. It's the speaking to the uh, port controllers with I squared C that is super slow. 20 microseconds is nothing. Uh, we will have no problem uh, meeting these timing requirements, all right? Again, I erase the whole chip. I don't care about the sector. To erase the whole chip, it's a lot like what we just saw when the three-byte special sequence. When you erase the whole chip, you have to send a super double secret uh, six-byte sequence because, you know, they just don't want you to do this by accident, right? And uh, uh, so we send a whole bunch of stuff out to the chip in the magical order, and then you send a, a hexadecimal 10 to this address, and then it erases the chip. Again, our concern is how long it takes to finish the whole thing, and it's really long, relatively speaking, but since we only do it once, it's no big deal, you know, at the beginning of our programming operation. It looks like we have to wait until we look at the timing diagrams to get all the timing data, all right? So let's look at this magical six byte thing for this. And the, up here, what is it? A three byte one for the um, programming of the bytes, right? So down here, there's like a table. Here's where it tells us, oh, you can find out what it's doing and when it's done if you don't want to wait the whole whopping time, which we're going to just wait and don't care. Uh, and yeah, blah, blah, blah. It talks about how great they are. That, you know, when you power it up and power it down, it, it, they try to prevent glitches from accidentally erasing and programming the chip. Thank you very much. This is what we're talking about, This these magical secret uh, handshake bytes, right? So it says, look, they provide this data projection scheme, and before you can program it or erase it or anything, they say we have to set out a three-byte or a six-byte sequence of values in a specific order for the chip to get unlocked and be able to um, uh, accept the data and, and do the commands, right? So these are the kind of commands that we have access to. Uh, some of them are the product ID. We can ask the chip what it is, who made it, and what size it is if we want. And I actually do this at the beginning of the flash programming sequence, and I actually have an error if it doesn't equal uh, BFB5, Okay, which is the one for the 128K flash, I exit the program. I should probably allow it to continue if it gets a B6 or a B7 as well, since it's the same exact code would work in all three cases. All right, we'll look at that in a minute. Maybe I'll even fix it while we're doing the video, and I'll go ahead and commit that change. Uh, all righty, so what is it? ID mode, exit and reset. Uh, this is looking ahead. Uh, what what they're talking about right in there is that when we do this SDP handshake thing, which is the special multiple sequence of bytes we send down there, uh, to do something like ask who the manufacturer is and how big the chip is, when we're done with that, we need to send another one, another command to stop it, get it out of that mode, and then run normal again. Okay, And again, we'll see that when we look at the waveforms. Okay. Uh, what do we got here? These talk about the voltages that are on the pins and stuff. And these are the commands. Here we go. Now, the way you read this table is if uh, I want to program a byte into the chip, what do I need to do? Well, this is a bus write cycle, all right? To program a byte into the chip, I have to write... A hex AA to this address in the flash. Then I got to write a 55 into that address in the flash. Then I got to write an A0 to this address in the flash. Then I have to put the, the address, the, if we look at this, the BA is the program byte address down here, this little uh, footnote number two. This is going to be the address that I want to store the data into. So if I want to program, a value uh, of, say, byte number at address uh, number five in the flash, I would put a five here at this time. 
okay? And I would put whatever data I want to program here, all right? So to program uh, some value X into flash memory address five, I got to send this, then that, then that, and then I can write the five into where I want it to go, okay? When I'm done with that, I'm done. And I then do the next one and the next one and so on. Now, I'm not going to do the sector arrays. I'm going to do the chip arrays, which is this sequence here, just more stuff. So before I do my byte programming, you know, if it's a brand new chip, you can just run in and, and start programming away. But if you've already programmed it once, you have to erase it, and then you can go and do a whole bunch of byte programs, okay? So it's same kind of game. This, 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 all this whole sequence here. And that'll erase the chip. And when, you, and when it does the erase, we'll see in a minute, it'll say it takes, I don't know how many milliseconds or something like that. So in order to deal with these delays, I just put some sleep uh, commands in the software as it goes. To ask about the, um, the manufacturer and the size of the chip, you send this. Then you read the two bytes we were just looking at up here from address zero. And then you read the value at address number one. These are just reading two bytes out of what would be the flash. But when you put it in the product ID mode and you start reading values from these two bytes, you get the, uh, the uh, manufacturer information instead of the data that you store in there. Okay. So once you put it in the mode, you read those two bytes, you have to then send something, either this or this to shut that mode back off in order for the chip to work normally again, okay? So that's what this table here means. Then down here, the absolute manual maximum voltages and uh, yeah, the shape of the waveforms that are optimal. And then it tells you how much current the thing uses. This is actually kind of surprising to me that <laughs> it needs that much, but that's, yeah, it's fine. It's less than an SD card. And then uh, what do we got here? Wait this long before you read from it after you power up. Wait this long before you uh, try to send a command erase or something. 100 micros, that's not going to be a problem for us. We, we're waiting a long time after the power goes on on our Raspberry Pi before we get to the point where we can start running commands. Way more than that. Uh, what else do we got? Uh, we can program it uh, at least 10,000 times, and it'll hold it for 100 years. I think I'm good there. And then we get all these timings, all right? Now, the key we want to walk away with here on these timings, all right? Let's see you buy the slowest chip, the 70 nanoseconds version, rather than the 55. Maybe this one's cheaper. I don't know. The longest it takes to do anything is 70 nano. Remember, we're plugging this thing into a, our retro Z80, and I'm running mine at 10 megahertz. And uh, remember that the, the, the shortest cycle that the Z80 performs is during opcode fetch, which is one and a half periods of its clock cycle. We talked about that when we were looking at how the Z80 controls stuff in that other video. And that was 150 nanoseconds. So I think we're covered, all right? Even if you include various, you know, other chips and decoders and propagation delays as a result of that, this is always going to work fine. On our Raspberry Pi, when we're setting up the flash to be programmed, we also have to meet these timing requirements. Uh, again, they're in nanos, and we're going to be so slow, nothing is going to be a problem for us. The What else do we look at in here? The critical thing is when you're programming a flash chip sometimes there's a maximum time if you look at these tables look, look very closely at these max values see we have a minimum you know if we want to you know what is the address setup time the address bus has to be set up at least this long before you know, we'll look at the table in a minute, or the, the, the timing diagrams in a minute. And that's before the chip enable goes active or the write enable and stuff like that, okay? So, they, I mean, these are really low, okay? <laughs> we have no problem hitting those at a minimum. And there is no maximum, all right? That's the key here. Sometimes a flash will say that the chip enable, when you're programming it, has to not be longer than some period of time. 
And if that was the case, the circuit that I designed would be a huge problem because it runs uh, really slow. All right. Now, this particular chip does not mandate that, it, that any of these signals be smaller than some number. Okay, so this particular product is perfect for this kind of a programmer, right? These maximum times here represent the times in which the chip will react to things that are happening. Now, how long will it take for the chip to respond when I uh, assert the output enable signal? Well, it will respond in this much time. This is not a, a, a pulse width maximum, all right? Those are down here which is going to show up in the, these, all right? If these had a maximum size, we might have to reconsider the design, okay? But it doesn't. That's the whole point of me bringing all this up. These maximums uh, up here and down here have to do with how long does it take to, you know, to access the, uh, the, uh, the software ID after you've given it, put it in that mode, right? 150 nano, not a problem. Uh, how long does it take to erase a sector? How long does it take to erase the chip? right? A hundred milliseconds, you know, a tenth of a second, all right? So I put a little sleep in the program to uh, wait. And when I say erase the chip, I wait, you know, however long I need to before I proceed on to do other things, okay? So this is the time it takes the chip to do something, not a limit on, on, on our control. And that's super important, all right? So we're free to do anything we want as long as we wait for the chip uh, using those numbers. Now, these are the tables that we have to look at and make sure that we're doing everything just right. If you want to read from the chip, what are we supposed to do? Well, there's a lot of things in here that have to do with, you know, if you want to do this, you want to do that or whatever, okay? But we only want to do one thing, right? As drawn, what it shows is what happens if you give it an address and then you change the address while the chip is enabled. And we're not going to do that, all right? So we don't have to worry about half of this diagram. If you did change the address, though, all they're saying here is if I have like address 1 and I enable the chip and I say, hey, turn on output enable so I can see your data, the data will turn on a little bit after, right? It'll turn on at uh, TOE amount of time after I assert the output enable signal. Okay, or TCE after I assert the chip enable. These one of these might be bigger than the other, or they might be equal. That's up here in this chart up here. The OE and the uh, what is it? CE, yeah, T C E and T sub O E, T sub uh, C E might be up here. C E 55 nano. And OE, 35, 70, you know, again, insanely fast compared to everything else that we're doing here, all right? So this is essentially right away, okay, for us. So uh, again, uh, if I have an address here and I assert chip enable and output enable, we'll see the data at that address. If I change the address while it's enabled, I can just see the next data if I want to. Okay, I don't, in other words, I don't have to raise this back up again and then change the address and then put them back down again to see the next value. Yeah, that might be nice. We could actually change our code a little bit uh, in order to make the reading of the flash go faster. We'll talk about the way that code works later, but I've kept it very simple. We just do one thing at a time and we cycle the chip enable and we change the address and we cycle it again. Okay, so we don't go too nuts with every possible thing we could do here. All right. Keep it simple. Uh, here's how we program a byte into the chip with regard to time. Remember it said you have to write this 5522AA55 uh, values into these addresses, okay? Then you use the address of the, of the byte you want to program, okay? So here's the three byte, you know, security, you know, sequence. Or the addresses that you're going to write those bytes to, followed by the address of the byte we want to program. All right, and down here they show you when you, uh, the first thing you do is you write AA in the data bus to this address, and you write 55 into this address, and so on. All right, that should match the table up here. Uh, where is it? All right. Program, 55 with an AA. Then you go to 2 AAA and write another... Uh, Five five. Then you go to five 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 again and write an A zero and so on. Okay. So this is what you're supposed to do. 
And then the timing diagram down here is when you're supposed to do it. And what does it look like with respect to every other signal, okay? So what they've got is another one of those things. Well, what if you want to do this? What if you want to do that? I'm like, I don't care. Let's do it the simplest way possible. Here's what we're going to do. The output enable when we're programming, okay? Right, enable controlled program cycle timing diagram. It says, look, just make sure output enable is high the whole time. That's what, that's what this really says to us. Yeah, you can mess around with it if you, I don't care. We're not going to mess around with it. Put it high, leave it high. Chip enable. Now, in theory, you can put chip enable low and keep it low the whole time. And you can assert write enable and then deassert it and then write enable again. And each time you do the write enable, you're programming, or, or, or shall I say, I use the wrong word, you're writing a byte into the flash. So we're going to write this, 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 and then we're going to write the data we want to program. So to program one byte, we have to write four, okay? And you can either turn chip enable on, OE off, and cycle the write repeatedly, or you can do the opposite way. You can turn write enable on, OE off, and you can cycle chip enable repeatedly, okay? Now... In this diagram, notice that you can optionally cycle both the chip enable and the write enable at the same time, okay? That's what we're gonna do. When we program, we're gonna write the three byte value followed by the address and the data we wanna store, wanna program in there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cycle both chip enable and write enable for each one of the bytes that we're gonna write to the flash chip, okay? And this is really basically the whole thing. Somewhere down here, it'll talk about, you know, what does it mean to do a sector erase? What does it mean to do a chip erase? And, you know, again, write, write the values in the correct order, cycling either chip enable and or write enable, just the same kind of a thing. And when you're done, you have to wait uh, whatever TSCE uh, is, which might be that 100 uh, uh, milliseconds or something like that, okay? All right, uh, what else do we got down here? Oh, here's the timing diagram for the ID. Uh, and, and yeah, like I said, we're going to do that as well. So again, you're going to write the three things using the exact same technique, cycling you know, one or the other. I'm going to do them both. And then you wait a little while, and then you read um, the, the two bytes back from bytes 0 and 1. Uh, let's look up TDA. Or is that IDA? Yeah, TIDA. Because honestly, when I wrote the code, I didn't pay attention to that. Uh, let's make sure we're good on that. I'll bet it's really small and it doesn't matter. 150 nano. Uh, not a problem. <laughs> As you'll see in a minute, we're sending whole massive commands out the I squared C bus just to change each one of these signals. And I squared C is running really slow. I mean, we're talking <laughs> like millisecond timing. So this is a thousand times uh, 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 faster than we need it to be. Okay. All right. So this is a document that's in the flash program or repo on GitHub. Uh, it's a LaTeX document. Uh, you can play around with it and format it if you want. I just created it for this video. I'll go ahead and give it to you as well. This is a diagram of what we're going to do. Now, this first one is how we're going to initialize everything. Uh, we'll talk about that one in a minute. Let's, while we're still fresh in our minds about the, what it means to write data into the flash chip and the order in which we want to do everything, that's what this diagram here shows. Okay. So, among other things, when we want to write a byte into the flash chip, not programming, but writing a byte to the flash, what are we going to do? We're going to send the address on the address bus. Then we're going to send the data on the data bus. And then we're going to turn both the write and the MREC signals on, make them active, active low. They're barred, remember. And then we're going to wait a little while, and then we're going to turn it back off. Now, we don't actually have to wait, <laughs> because, again, the I squared C is so slow that this width of this pulse is like five light years long compared to what the uh, flash chip is capable of doing. All right? So we're going to just rapid fire, write an address value out, write a data value out, assert these two signals, unassert them, and we're done. Okay? Then we're going to change the address and the data, and then we can write another byte and so on.
All right. So that's what this diagram shows. And what we're looking at is the uh, timing diagram of the signals that happen in what order from this function here that we're going to look at in the flash programming code. Well, the read cycle is even easier because we don't have to worry about the setup time on the data bus, right? We have an address. And then we simply assert that the uh, read signal needs to be on. And MREC needs to be on. And because the chip is going to respond almost immediately, this delay here is massively exaggerated. But I included it in there but so that you real yes, you know, it is it, it, the flash will give us the data a little bit after we assert these signals. But on this scale, it's instantaneous, okay? Uh, the reason this is drawn with, is, as wide as it is, is because as we look at the code, what's going to happen is I'm going to assert the read signal in the MREC. Then I need to read the value off the data bus. And that takes an I squared C transaction in its own right, which causes this whole thing to take lo a lot longer, okay? Which is fine. Uh, when we're done reading the data from the data bus, we then uh, unassert these signals over here, all right? So let's go back up to the top here. Uh, what is this? This is the initialization, all right? How do we, how do, we do this? How do we get started, right? Because we're going to see that in order to get the flash chip enabled, the one thing we have to do, and we've talked about this before, is we have to reset the retro board. So, among other things, you're going to see the reset go active and then inactive here. And remember, the reason for that is because the reset signal goes to this RS latch here. We need flash select to go active, which is low. So we need reset to go low here. So this circuit latches onto a 0 coming out for flash cell and a 1 coming out of SRAM cell. Once this circuit goes into reset mode, and this is zero, then I can control MREC to control the flash MREC signal over here. Okay, this equals MREC as long as flash cell is low. All right, and again, you can remember kind of how the flash is hooked up. So the, the program input, the chip enable, and the output enable, these things are all hooked up like this. So the flash programmer has control of MREC and reset. So by asserting reset, and then we can control MREC here. That's how we control this pin. We have direct access to control the write and the read whenever we want. So we have the ability to generate any of the waveforms you just saw, provided that we request the bus from the Z80. Okay, here's the connector that we use to hook up the the. Um, the flash programmer, right? So we're going to assert bus request almost right away after the Z80 will acknowledge and grant us the bus. And when that happens, the Z80 disconnects itself from all the address lines here and all the data lines. It also disconnects itself from MREC, IO rec, read and write. So we have control over whatever we want to do. And in this case, especially the flash chip, right? So it should make some sense that when we initialize the stuff, what we're going to do is we're going to request the bus. And we'll look at it in a minute to confirm that the Z80 will respond with bus hack in less than five clock states, five T states. When we were looking at, you know, how the Z80 controls stuff, the, uh, the, the longest delay that you could see with the bus hack is five of these so-called T states. And each one of these T states lasts one period of the system clock, which is 10 megahertz. So this is at most five 10 millionths of a second of a delay here. Again, this is drawn grossly exaggerated. So therefore, to take over the control of the retro board and prepare to program the flash, what we need to do is request the bus because the Z80 could be doing anything, realize, before we request the bus. We don't know what it's doing. By, uh, you know, if it came along over here and it reset this circuit over here by accessing port 70, we might not have control of the flash, all right? So what we need to do is stop the Z80. I'm going to do that by requesting the bus. 
once that's been done, it, we are, we're, we're guaranteed that the Z80 won't do anything at all. So while it's doing nothing, we're going to reset it. And we're going to reset it, and we're going to keep bus request on at the same time. So when we're done resetting it, if the bus acknowledges glitching or anything due to resetting, and it will, right? By definition, when you're when the Z80 is reset, it will not assert bus ac. You'll see it actually go high again. But as soon as we're done resetting it, bus ac will immediately go low again, and that's what we want. Okay, we've got a reset that causes the reset circuit to enable the flash MREC signal. And we know that as soon as the Z80 comes out of reset, when this signal goes high, it will notice bus rec is low. Even if it tries to execute part of one instruction, that's okay. As long as it doesn't do an I.O. operation and flip that uh, the reset circuit again. It'll then regrant the bus acknowledgement right away. Okay, And this will happen. Okay, So at this point in time over here, we know that we have been granted the bus and that the reset circuit will have a 1 here and a 0 here, which is exactly what we need. Once we're in this state, we can start doing right, bus write cycles to the flash. We can do bus read cycles to the flash, whatever we want to do. Okay, When we're done with everything, we're going to release the bus and give it back to the Z80. Okay, And we're going to do that in the diagram on the last page of this document. It'll do this. We will have uh, data still lingering around on the address bus and the data bus. So we have to shut off our flash program and disconnect it from the address bus. We're going to disconnect the data uh, buffers and stuff from the flash programmer from the data bus. And we're going to also disconnect the our, the flash programmer from the read, write, MREC, and IO request signals. All right, we're going to disconnect the, the programmer from every single thing except the reset signal and the bus rec signal. All right. Then once we're disconnected from everything but those two, we're going to release the bus request, and I'm going to reassert reset again. Okay. Because God knows what glitches or something could go on. We need to make sure that the Z80 starts fetching instructions from address zero again. Okay? So remember when we request the bus in the first place, when it comes out of reset, it may or may not have fetched an instruction or something like that. We don't really know how far it got before it granted the bus. Right? We know it probably at most executed one instruction. That's probably a given. But we need it to start over again. So I'm going to reassert reset exactly the same time I release the bus request. It'll then acknowledge it, and I'll release the reset, and the Z80 will boot up and do what it normally does, which is set the program counter to zero, start fetching and executing instructions. So I hope that you can see that this is a definitely a brute force subset of all the possible things we can do to read data from the flash according to the data sheet and to write data into the flash chip according to the data sheet here, okay? So how does this all then work in our code in the Raspberry Pi? So in the project for the Z80 programmer, okay, let's go back up here in the top level directory. Here's all the files. You clone this off of GitHub or copy it or whatever you're gonna do to check it out or grab a zip file, however you wanna do that. You're going to get the schematic files here, the Gerbers, you can order your own, whatever you want to do. In this Pi directory is this program, flash.c, right here. And there's a little debugging uh, thingy here. I write the, I use this in a lot of my programs. Uh, we could maybe talk about this in a video on its own. The short of it is, if I say dbg, I'm really doing the same thing as a regular old printf but it does a lot of extra stuff. It prints out other things like, you know, the file name and the line number and stuff that it comes from. I find this to be a pretty handy uh, way to generate debug output in my programs. All right, so let's just leave that as it is. And look at the actual code here. So uh, where are we at? The usual include a bunch of stuff. Now, this is a bare bones C program. I'm not using a bunch of kooky libraries and Perl and Python and everything else. No, 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 no. We are going to open up the raw device and we're going to use the bottom of the barrel read and write commands to control the I2C bus. Okay. So what do we know? We have to have 
the I squared C addresses from each of the two MCP twenty three hundred seventeen chips. Okay, and in the schematic, I wired them to twenty six and twenty four. Okay, and a little comment over here. This is the one that's on the address bus. This is the one that's on the control and data bus. And these are examples of perhaps poorly named macros. <laughs> Maybe I should have called this one the address, bu uh, 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 um, the address bus uh, I squared C address, and this was the data one, and so on. Uh, be that as it may, it, it it evolved into what it is. All right. So a little doc down here, the EX one, which I in my mind I call those expando ports. These are actually uh, uh, um expansion interface chips or something like that they are gpio expansion ports or something like that in the data sheet so these are expando chips as far as i'm concerned and they have an a port and a b port and each of those is eight bits we talked about all this in the flash programmer uh hardware video earlier on uh ex2 has the data bus and the control bus signals on it and they are these okay now, there's something interesting about the reset pin and the M1 pin here, all right? We have to, first of all, M1 is not something that we're going to use, nor are we ever going to control it, nor does the Z80 ever even yield control of it during, like, if I do a bus request. The Z80 doesn't let me take this over. It's hooked up. I had an extra pin. Maybe we can monitor it if we want, but whatever. We're going to just ignore it. Key is... Never drive this signal. You're not supposed to. So when we look at which pins are inputs and which pins are outputs and when they are, we'll notice that M1 is always an input. Okay. We'll also notice that bus rack and reset are always outputs. In the read, write, M rec and IO rec, these will be outputs when we've been granted access to the bus. And when we've not been granted access to the bus, we configure these actually as inputs so that there's no conflict on the bus, all right? So that's what the logic is that you'll see uh, uh, these comments down here. What do I got going on? I got a bunch of macros. So which bit of the port B on EX2 is for the reset signal? That's the least significant bit and so on, all right? I got a little couple of comments over here. Like I just said, the reset is always going to be an output all the time. The bus request signal is always an output all the time. The bus ACK and the M1, both, we never drive them. Those are always inputs, okay? Turns out neither of these are really a concern. And uh, I'll mention that a little bit later. There's a, in the, there's a comment below in the code why I don't care about whether I've been acknowledged or not, okay? short of it is it'll always acknowledge before I have a chance to look at it anyway. So we don't even need to check. Uh, what do we got going on here? I got a couple of macros because this was getting noisy in the code below. I have this notion of the, the bus control. And when I talk about bus control, I'm talking about this set of signals right here. If the general notion of off and on Okay, and this off is when we have not been granted the bus. When we have been granted the bus, we turn on a bunch of output signals, namely the ones I just showed you up here. These four signals we turn on when we've taken over the bus. And when we have not taken over the bus, we turn these four signals off or make them inputs, okay? And that's what this is. These bit masks here are set up so that if I ever write out the value of control off, that sets up what? Bus request and reset as outputs, and all the other uh, signals are inputs. All right, so we have a minimum number of outputs if we set the bus direction, as we'll see, to off. If we turn it on, then what are we doing? We're setting all the things as outputs except for the bus acknowledgement and the M1 signal, and that makes sense. Right? All these are outputs when we take over the bus. Only reset and bus requests are outputs when we don't take over the bus. All right, so that's what these two macros do. This down here is to keep track of which direction the bits are set on the data lines and the address lines. All right, they're either all going to be in and all going to be out, you know, for on a per board basis. And there's three ports total involved in this, right? Because remember, the address bus has 16 pins, so there's two ports 
to control all the address lines, and there's one port to control the data lines. And we control e the data and the address lines independent of each other. So what's the point? Is to remind me what the value is supposed to be when I want the bus to go into an input mode versus an output mode. All right? I don't have to remember that zero is out and all ones is in and so on, right? Handy self-documenting code. Got a couple of variables here to remember what the last value is. <laughs> did did we set the, what did we set all the control uh, uh bus pins to? You know, what was the value? This one here is how we remember what did we send the uh the data bus? Is it currently an output mode or an input mode? Okay? And you'll notice that I initialize it to an impossible value. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, okay, so let's go down here into the main so we can see what gets called in what order. Maybe this will make more sense, or some sense, I don't know. And there's a bunch of debug code still in here, that's fine. Uh, modus operandi, what do we do? Open up the S squared C port, initialize the chip, and assert the bus request to steal the bus. Okay, then what? We're going to read and print out the product ID information that we just looked at from the flash chip. If it is not valid, <laughs> terminate now, because God knows what's going on, right? Uh, if it is valid, we're going to bulk erase the whole thing, and then we're going to go one byte at a time, and what we're going to do is read from standard in a binary uh, set of data in a, in a loop. Read one byte, program it. Read a byte, program it, and so on. And we're going to just assume that the very first byte we read goes into address zero, the second byte goes to address one, and so on. I'm not going to waste my time writing all these hex file and moto s record file loader. Forget all that. Convert it to raw binary, shove it in a flash, and we're done. You want to enhance this in some way, knock yourself out. Turns out that every time you program the flash, what you're really going to do is write the code that the Z80 executes when it boots, and that code is always at zero, starts at zero, and goes up as big as the program uh, file really is. So this turns out to be pretty handy. It's really no big deal. Uh, it's easy to write, easy to understand, and brute force, always, you know, always easy. So that's why this is this way. If we need fancier stuff, we can do that later. Uh, what do we do? When I run the end of file on the input uh, data that I'm reading in. I release the Z80 bus. Actually, this doc is wrong. I don't release the bus. I still have the bus. Why? Because I want to read all the contents of the flash back in. <laughs> and then I'm going to compare it. So once I'm done programming, make sure that, you know, what I did actually was stored in the flash. All right. And th then I'm going to release the bus. Okay. And we'll look at the code for all this in a minute. Okay, so what's going on here? What do we got? Here's the buffer that I'm going to read data into, all right? And I, I keep a copy of what I've read uh, so that I can do the comparison in order to compare it against what was read back from the flash, right? The IIC variable here, what that is, is when I open up a device or a file on, in Unix, right, uh, it gives me a file handle back, which is an integer, all right? So if we look at open IIC, we pass it whatever this is, and we saw it up above, it's the name of the device node in Linux. It's going to be dev slash, you know, I, I squared C1 or something like that. It's this, uh, where is it? It's right here. This is the technical name of the I squared C device, which is the default one that you use in a Raspberry Pi 4. Um, be careful if you got like a Pi 1 or something like that. The early Pi's before they had a 40 pin connector, they had a different uh, name that would like bus zero or something like that. So they changed the Raspberry Pi Foundation changed the name of this thing somewhere along the way. Uh, since this is not designed for a 26 pin header or whatever the other physical size is, this is probably fine for anything that you're going to want to plug into this programmer. So what are we doing? We're going to pass that string. I can't find my code. Here it is. That string gets passed to this function here. And then this function is going to open up that file and give us the file handle back. So let's search for that in here. Here's the source code. Open the port. Dev is the device file to open. On a Pi, use this, okay? Uh, when it's done, it'll return the file descriptor or a negative one if it failed to open it. And I didn't bother to check in the main. And this doesn't abort here. So this will probably go down in flames if the... Um, 
if it couldn't open up this 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 file or if you make a mistake or something like that uh so yeah whatever you get it's free it's open source you can fix it if you want uh so what do we do we we call the open command and we give it the uh the string that was passed in and i say i want to use this in a read write mode because we need to both read from the I2C bus and write data to the I2C bus. If it doesn't work, we're going to print this message out before the thing dies anyway, so we'll know, all right? And there's a little debug macro. And when it prints it out, it'll say, hey, I was in this function called OpenIIC in file whatever. What's this file? Flash.c on line number uh, 126, and I'm printing out this, all right? So it's a super readable uh, print line. Uh, when if uh, if it fails or not, it still returns the FD number, which will be you know the net, the the file handle for the uh, I squared C bus. Okay. Uh, if you don't know what the open does at the bottom, that's as low level as you can get in 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 Unix. That's the direct call to the operating system to open that thing up. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call this init function, and we just looked at the waveform that this function allegedly will generate on the bus, okay? So here's the source code for this thing. And you'll see how this thing correlates with the waveform diagram. What's the doc say in here? Set it up with all the control lines set to input. Remember that macro, I said there's an in and an out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set it all up. We're gonna request control of the bus, but we're gonna not uh, take any control of the bus. All right, we need to request it and we're not yet going to assert any real control, all right? So what are we going to do? Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, we need to know the file handle so we can talk to the bus. And what does it say? It'll leave the bus request signal asserted, and the reset will not be asserted, all right? So what's going to look, look, look at the code? So what are we going to do? We're going to write something. What is this doing? We're going to write to EX1, and we're going to write two zeros to it. Let's look and see what this function does. Uh, there's a couple of them. Notice this says write underscore B, and this one up here says write underscore A, and this is write without any underscore, all right? This is the one that gets called. So what does it do? It says write the given values to, to, the, to the port registers for A and B, the A and B ports of the uh, specified uh, port expander. So what do we got? The I squared C file handle. We got the address of the I squared C device, right? So that's going to be your EX1 or your EX2. And then we're going to have the values that it's going to write into the A and B port registers. Remember the I squared C chips. We have two ports, the A and B, right? This is going to write it into the registers of those chips. It does not mean that it's going to output the data from the chip. Okay, at this point in time, allegedly, you know, if we just powered it up, those chips will be in a power on reset mode. And they're all but will at that time be configured for input. And if we write data into these port registers, it'll take it, but it won't do anything with it. So it'll retain that data so that if it is set to become an output later on, it will then output the data, all right? That's kind of what's going on here. So uh, how do we do this? I mean, we don't dive into the details of I squared C, but the short of it is you use this I octal call on the file handle representing the opened up I squared C bus. We tell it that we uh, want to operate the chip in slave mode, so we're in control of the bus, and we want to talk to the uh, device that has this address here, okay? So that'll be your EX1 or your EX2, with your 24 or 26 uh, for the two addresses of the chips, all right? And if it fails, we gripe and return. If it does not fail, what we do is we build a message, and these messages are defined in the manual for the MCP 23017. I'm not going to get into all the details here. The short of it is you're going to write to register 12, which represents GPIO port A. You know, the register for A, I should say. And I'm going to give it these A and B parameters here. Okay, and by writing two bytes out, what happens is I send 
not only to port A, and it takes the value for this, but since I write a second one, it takes that second byte and puts it out into the port B register. So I can do them both at once. Okay, I transfer the data, make sure it works. If it didn't work, I gripe. And if it does work, I return a zero down here. Okay, this is the the basic way to update the values on uh, you know an I squared C device, and which port you, which register numbers you use and all that stuff is all based in the manual that you can sift through. Uh, once you know these numbers, you can you can you should be able to make sense of this. There's so many options. As I'm only going to access like four registers out of the you know a couple of dozen that are on the chip. Okay. So this is pretty straightforward subset of the otherwise, you know, huge list of all the things that could be done with that chip. Uh, okay, so remember this was right, and then we have a write A. Okay, notice this only has an A, and the message ends with only one byte. So if we want to, we can send only a byte out to port A without having to update port B. That's the difference between this and the one above. And this one is only to write to port B, but not to port A. Okay, And to do that, we say write this to 13 instead of 12. And we give it the one byte. And again, we send the data out and make sure it worked okay and gripe if there's an error. So that's it for writing data out to the I squared bus, the I squared C bus rather. There's nothing else that we do for writing. The only other thing left then is reading. And reading works a whole lot like writing in that you need to know the, uh, the file handle and the address of the chip you want to interact with. You put the, the, um, the bus into the right mode for the address of the chip you want to talk to, make sure everything's okay. We create a message. And what we're doing here, you'll notice we're using the same registers here. And, and we're going to write out the register number. Then we're going to read back the value from those registers. So when we write to, to register 12 and then we send data, we're outputting data into the register inside the port expander. If we send the address of a register down there, but we don't send any data with it, we're only sending one byte here, then what happens is we've prepared the chip so that we can then read and get the value from that register instead of updating the register, okay? And the way this partic particular chip works is if we read from GPIO port A in register 12 and or GPIO port B in register 13 in hex, we get the input values, okay? I am straightforward. We're either write, write out to them or read them back in, okay? And uh, what this is going to do is it's going to return the value of both ports in a 16-bit integer such that, uh, what did I do? I put port A on the least significant byte. And port B is in the most significant byte. And this matches the order of the, uh, I guess, the address bus or something like that. So if you read the value of the address bus, it would it would come out right. You know, otherwise the bytes would be flipped around backwards. Okay. So the only thing then left that has low level I squared C operations going on in it is this direction control command. All right. Notice we got the I squared C file handler. We got the address of the chip just like before and we have a and b values this allows me to select which pins on port a and port b are going to be used for inputting data and which ones are going to be used for outputting data okay so you're going to see set dear be used with these values up here you know the the direction control the um, bus in and out and stuff like that, right? The same with this. Whether the control bus is going to have the uh, pins uh, controlling output data on the read and write and MREC and all that, or whether we're going to be able reading from those uh, signals. Maybe if we read from them, uh, we'll be able to see what the Z80 is doing with them, right? So that's what the direction's all about. And you'll see this looks a whole lot like all the other, the read and the write above, in that, what do we do? We tell the, the bus what chip we want to talk to and return if there's an error. And when we build a message and we send it out, this is a three-byte message. And what are we doing? We're, all we're going to do is we're going to send this one to a different register. Instead of going to hex 12, we're going to go to zero. And if we write to register zero, 
that controls the direction of all the pins for port A. And if we continue on, and then we're writing to port number, or rather uh, uh, address number one in the I squared C device for the MCP 23017, that will be the direction control for port B. All right, so that's I mean, as simple as that. You say, hey, I want to configure, you know, uh, a bunch of pins in port A as inputs and the other ones as outputs and so on for port B, all right? So that's all we have to care about for I squared C in the low level code. Down here, we have higher level routines that are dependent on those lower level routines. We started all that because we were here, okay? So what does this really do? Send all the, all the bits of port A and B the, the register bits, remember, to all zero for the address uh, bus control in the uh, MCP 23017 that's connected up to the address bus, all right? Now, remember, that chip at this time, assumably we just turned on the power, is actually has all those pins set to inputs. So this will have no side effect, no visible side effect, right? This will set all the pin bits to zero in the register that will be outputted later on if we ever set the pins to output mode, okay? Now we're gonna play the same game with the control pins and the data bus down here. What are we doing here? This is the cache. Remember, we're gonna say, remember what I set all the uh, control lines to. Now I could actually go out and ask the IO expansion chip what those are set to if I wanted to, but it's much faster for me to just remember <laughs> if I wanna know uh, in a variable in here. So what am I doing? I'm sending bus request to low, and I'm sending reset to low. Now let's be really careful about this reset signal. Remember that the reset signal in the Flash programmer board controls an, uh, a transistor. So this is actually a positive signal, while this one's a negative one. All right, so this is a little little subtle, but that's why I, I commented it up here. Preset every control line so that they're unasserted. In, in other words, every control line is high, except for bus rec, which is low, and IO reset, which is also low, right? But when reset is low, it means it's unasserted from the perspective of this software, right? All right, so what do we then do? We, we, we say, I remember what I've written out there, and then I say, okay, write out to expando number two. That's the value for the data bus, which we don't care. We could just use write underscore B if we really wanted to. But this at least sets the data bus to some known value so that when looking at it on a scope, we don't have random junk in there that'll confuse us, right? Set all the bits of the data bus high and set all the control pins to this value here. Okay, again, just like we did up here, nothing is set to output mode yet. So this is just getting all ready, okay? It's not until we get down here that we actually will assert the bus request line that comes out of the GPIO expander chip because we're gonna set the direction of all the bits in the data bus to inputs, which means we're not gonna take control of the data bus here. And we're gonna set the control lines to what we saw above, which I, I consider like the off mode, which is the only, only thing we're gonna take control over are the reset line and the bus request line, okay? And since we already preloaded the register for that port up here, to these values that I just explained, we'll assert bus request true, which is low, and it will unassert the reset signal, which is also low at this time, okay? So that is the point in time where this diagram shows us taking up our bus request right here, okay? When we set the direction to off, We've taken control at that point of bus request and reset. And bus request is going to be low. And remember, this is the perspective of reset from the Z80. And that's active low. And the GPIO output pin on the flash controller is inverted. So it's true there. Okay.
And that threw me a little bit uh, on and off again while writing this code. And just keep your wits about you and you'll be fine. Uh, okay, so and that's what the, all this is doing, right? So bang, we just take over control of the bus. By the time we execute this down here, an, an eon has passed. The Z80 will have granted us access. And the other thing is, by the way, if you're bringing your board online for the first time, and you want to try programming the flash and you don't want to, don't put all the other chips you don't even need to put the Z80 in the circuit and this is why down here we don't really care about the acknowledgement in here because if you if you want to program a flash in your Z80 retro board and there's no Z80 in there to assert bus ack then and if this thing wants to you know something to assert it and let us know it'll never happen and since we know for a fact that if we requested it and we wait forever, which is what happens on an I squared C bus. Uh, we will have it, so I don't bother checking it at all. I know we have it at this point, or <laughs> there's no Z80 there to grant it to us, and either way, we don't care. Okay, so what do we do after we request the bus? Then we know the Z80 grants it if it's there. We then assert the reset signal by raising it up. Okay, we take the one up here which is, you know, the reset signal and bus requests are both low there. We send the same value out with reset high, and then we take reset low again. That's what causes this pulse to do this, all right? Keep in mind, this is upside down, okay? So after that, we're going to turn on the address bus, okay? And we're going to take control over these signals too. So what do we expect to see? Yes, uh, yeah, a little note in here. And by the way, the Z80 will glitch the bus act line, but it's okay. I talked about that earlier. Uh, and it'll go back again. And certainly by the time that we start talking about uh, you know, sending more messages over I squared C here. So what happens here? We're gonna set the direction for the data and control uh, bus. And we're going to leave the data direction alone, which is still set to input because that was initialized up there, right? But we're going to turn on the control bus. So now we've taken control of everything. And because we've already written a value out on the control bus up here, it's still set at this point to have bus request low. The reset signal we'll say is not asserted, right? The Z80 will see it high. Okay, again, because it's inverted here, okay? Uh, and everything else will then be high on the control bus when we do this. And it turns out they were all high already anyhow because the Z80 granted the bus. We have pull-up resistors on all those signals, so this is really a no change, but we will have taken over the bus, okay? Then down here, what are we doing here? This is where we say take all the pins on the address bus on expand out one and set every one of them to out and then we're going to just leave the bus on the address bus will just stay on the whole time until we release it when we're all done okay so this is how we're going to take over the bus and it matches the waveform diagram you just saw ultimately when we're all done here's how we're going to release it we might as well look at the code while we're here uh all we're really going to do is shut off the all the address bus we're going to shut off the data bus. And we don't want to be driving anything on those buses at this time. And we're going to just turn off the control bus. And remember that when we turn off the control bus, what we're really doing is shutting off all the pins except bus request and reset. Okay. And the bus request will still have been asserted at this time. All right. As we'll see, we never change it while we're programming the flash. This is the first time that we'll ever adjust it after the initial time, okay? So what do we do down here? We're gonna set reset high, which makes it asserted, because it's upside down compared to everything else. And we're gonna set bus request high as well, which causes that one to go off. So this turns on reset and off bus request at the very same time. Again, this matches our waveform diagram on the last page down here. When we do this here, it goes high, and this one here will go low. All right. Then we're going to deassert reset, at which point the Z80 will take control and boot up our code. All right. And here's us. Uh, what are we going to do here? Here's us deasserting the reset. 
after we have asserted it here, shut the reset off. And of course, we're leaving the bus request off as well. At this point, the Z80 is off and running, takes over. All right. So that's the init. And by the way, here's the, uh, the release is called right there before we print out whether the thing matches it or not. So what happens next? Uh, we're going to read the product ID. And we'll see that does a little dance of writing the, the uh, SPD and then uh, read the values back from address, uh, byte address zero and one. And we're going to make sure that it looks good. And as I said earlier, uh, because I want this to work for everybody, even if you, get, you can't get the smaller flashes, let's go back to the manual here and find the other codes. Did I just go by them? Oh, there is a little table right here. So I said I want it to be BFB5, but it could also be B6 and B7. So what are we going to do? We need to do it the, the, 5, 6, or 7. So if it's not equal to that, and it is not equal to B6, and it is not equal to B7, then we have a, fr a problem here, okay? If it's okay, we're going to proceed. Now I have a little debug code left in here from before. I was playing around. I'll just leave it there. Uh, the idea was I, I had my oscilloscope hooked up to the, uh, the bus control lines and stuff, so I can actually watch it go on, watch it do the signature request, and then stop it right away, which is better than trying to run the entire programming sequence and then tr and try and sift through that on, the, uh, on my scope. All right, so look, let's look at the code at what this thing does, all right? And you're going to see this takes and uses the uh, the stuff we just looked at, the bus cycle routines. Uh, what happens? To read a product ID, what have we got for the doc up here? We need to know the file handle for the um, the flash uh, controller on the uh, I squared C bus, all right? So what are we going to say? Send SDP out there. And I pass it a 90. Let's see what's this SDP. Here it is. So this is the code. That, that, okay, here's where we go. The bus cycle, we're going to say, write out the 5.5, five, and then this, this. We saw this in the, in the manual already. And then the third byte is the command. All right? And then after that is, like, reading and writing the uh, flash memory or programming the bytes and stuff, all right? So let's review quickly the SDP thing here in the manual. So I got an AA55 to these guys, and then I'm writing a command to 555, which I said is 90 in this case. So we look back at this table. Here we go. We can focus on the table at this point. We want to read the software ID. So we need to do this, right? So there's the AA5590. That's why we have a 90 in there. Notice every single one of these commands are writing the AA55 and then A0 for this, AA5580, and then we got an AA5580 and then some other stuff for the chip erase. All right, so every one of these, this SDP thing, sends out everything over to here, and the value there is the command byte that's passed into the function. Well, that makes sense, right? So we're going to use that every time we want to do a chip erase or an ID or the byte program and stuff. You'll see it call the same routine. So that's exactly what we want. We get the AA, the 55, and the 90. That puts it into uh, the flash uh, manufacturer ID uh, uh, mode. So what are we doing? We're going to call the read cycle, and then we're going to call another read cycle, and we're going to print it out. And then we're going to send an SDP with a command that's F0, which is the exit from the manufacturer ID code mode, right? Which is the one down here, blah, 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 with an F0. All right, so that's what we do for the SDP stuff, to put it in the software ID mode and then take it back out when we're done, right? And then we're going to return the manufacturer and the product ID code like this. Uh, and that leaves us with these bus read cycle things here, all right? So, so far we looked at the, like, the I squared C low level things, right, that talk directly to the MCP 23017 chips. And then I've got these other routines that all start with bus underscore, right? So we got bus underscore, we got flash underscore, all right? These ones have to do with talking to the flash chip, 
These have to do with talking to the Z80 bus, right? The higher level abstraction over the, just to talk to the, um, the uh, GPIO expander chips, okay? So here's the read cycle source code. And what this is going to do is it's going to perform the read cycle that we just looked at a little while ago in the waveform when we want to read a byte from the bus, all right? So again, it takes the I squared C file handle. This is the address that it needs to send out on the Z80 bus for the data it wants to read. So what are we doing? We're going to write out to EX1, which is the address uh, lines connected to it, right? And we're going to send out the most significant byte and the least significant byte of the address to the two ports. Okay. Now here's where this direction cache stuff comes in. This is an optimization that speeds up the code massively. We're not going to super be careful about whether or not, you know, the direction for the data bus is set to an input or an output at any given time. We're going to be sloppy and just leave it the way we left it the last time we used it. And the reason we're going to do that is because usually if you're going to read like the whole flash, you're going to read every byte one after another. And we don't want to have to turn the the bus on again and off again and on again and off again for each one of those because I squared C is super slow and we only have so many hours to live our entire lives. So what this does is it says, is it already in the direction? Is it in the mode I want it to be or not? If it's not currently set to the input mode, then make it so. And remember that I put it into input mode. Now think back up at the top of the uh, program here. Remember when I said I initialized this direction cache variable to 0f and said that is an illegal value? This is super important so that the first time I come through this code, we were at like line number 390, I think. And uh, no, we weren't at 390. Where were, oh yeah, I guess we were. Here's the read cycle. Well, the first time that we execute this code, we need to make sure we got it in the right mode. So no matter what, the very first time this is done, it can't equal this. Okay? Even if it is technically an input mode, we don't know what mode it's in when this program first starts running. So this will always be false on the first try. So we then say, make it in, even if it already is, and we say, make it so. And that's what this thing's doing right here. So if we then call this again, it'll come in here. And then this will be false because it already is in the mode we want. We save the time it takes to do this, which <laughs> feel free to comment out this if and do it every time in your copy of the code and just see how much this thing slows down. All right. So this is strictly a performance enhancement here. Okay. All right. So uh, what do we do after we make sure the data bus is set to input mode? We need to assert MREC and read. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, we know that the control ca the control bus is always idle unless we do something with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say whatever it is now, and it should be like bus request is on and reset is not on and everything else is off. We're going to make sure that we assert MREC and read. We're going to write that out. And we're not going to change the cached value here because we're going to set it right back again down here and it doesn't matter. We don't want to change it. We want to change it to assert the MREC and read lines like we saw on the diagram. We're going to go out and get the value from the data bus, and then we're going to turn MREC and read back off. Again, just like the diagram shows for the uh, read cycle here, okay? Data on, assert both of these. We assume the data will be arriving by the time we send the next command, which is an E on, and it will be. We read the what's on the data bus, and then we deassert this, okay? And that's what these three commands do right here. So what then happens after the uh, after we read the uh, the first byte from address zero, we then read another byte from address number one, okay? And what we're doing, we got the manufacturer's ID and the product ID. We then print them out. We do the F0, I already talked about that. We then 
put manufacturer in the left half and product in the right half, return it as a 16-bit value to whoever calls this function here, which was in our main, okay? So that's when we then compare to make sure that it looks good and die if it doesn't otherwise proceed down to here. This is when we actually do the real work, all right? You can end it if you want to and debug the program or not. Then we call uh, the chip erase. When we're done with that, we go into a loop, we're reading one byte at a time, and each time we do read in a byte, we call program byte, okay? And we also make sure that we didn't get too many bytes, right? Because we can only store a 64K, even if we have the bigger flash, right? Because we only have 16 bits in our data bus. So if this is ever true, then you did something wrong, you sent a file that's too big. So it'd be nice to know, <laughs> let the user know there's a problem with their code. All right, so that's basically what's going on here. If we look up chip erase, it'll do the same thing you saw for the manufacturer's ID, and it'll set the SDP value out for 80, then it'll do it with a 10, then it'll wait because it said we need to wait, okay? And then it returns. So let's look up SDP 80 and then SDP 10. For the full chip erase, there's the SDP and there's the 80. There's the SDP again, same thing with a 10, all right? And as long as you wait long enough, for the chip to finish its job, you can then proceed on and continue using it. All right, so that's how the erase works. And that leaves us with the program byte, okay? And again, you're gonna see the SDP followed by the uh, data value that you wanna write in there. Surprise, surprise, SDP OA. And then we do a single byte write cycle on the bus to the address that's been passed in and the data. And we wait because we're supposed to, and this is like way longer than we need to, but it will guarantee never to fail if we wait long enough. And we're done, right? So STP A0 followed by writing a byte to the given address. And if we look at byte program, here's STP A0 followed by the byte data to the user given address. All right, that all looks good. So what happens after we do, there's your loop, okay? When we're done with all that, we come down there and then we wanna read the data back again. All right, so well, there's something subtle about this loop here I forgot to point out. When we're reading the data in one, at a byte, one byte at a time, notice that we're doing this. We're saving it in this buffer that I kind of glossed over up here. This buffer up here for every byte that we read in from standard in, and program into the flash, we save it in this buffer here, 64K in size, right here in this loop, okay? When we're done, we come back in here and there's another buffer, that's read buffer. And we set the, uh, we start the read address at zero, and we say for that, for, well, read address is less than the adder value, and if you look up here when we're writing, we count, and use that for the address for the writing the whole time. When this loop ends, adder equals the number of bytes that we wrote total, which is the last address of the thing, the, the first address, I should say, that we did not program until after the end of everything that was in the, in the file that we programmed into the flash, okay? So this one says, for all those same range of bytes, do a simple read cycle. Now in here, we don't care about all the SDP and everything else. We're just using this flash as a regular flash at this point. So all we need to do is sit, put the address out there on the bus and assert the MREC and read and just simply get the data uh, off the bus, just like we saw inside of the uh, manufacturer ID logic that called the same function to get the byte. And we put it in this array here. We add one to the read address. We print them all out as we go. When we're all done with that, this is where we release the bus. And then we do a compare. Does every byte in the, in the program buffer equal every byte in the read buffer one for one for this many total bytes? If that's true, then this thing will return a zero and I print out success, otherwise it says it fails. So I think we looked at every single thing in here, but I think I kind of glossed over the write cycle, <laughs> all right? Um, we didn't dive into this when we were in the program logic, but you'll see this works exactly like the read.
Is the data direction, you know, in the direction that I want it to be, right? Is is the data bus currently outputting, which is what we need for writing, okay? If it's not, make it so by setting the, you know, the direction uh, bits to output and setting the uh, all the bits in that direction. So when we're writing and writing and writing and spinning through here at a million miles an hour, uh, it would be nice not to waste time changing the direction of the uh, data bus if we don't have to. That Again, that's the optimization there. We assert MREC and write, and then we just deassert them right away. And this takes so long that it's way longer, no matter what speed you run I squared C at. It's absolutely impossible for this signal to be asserted for less than the 70 nanosecond, uh, you know, minimum that's allowed. All right. So this will write uh, the one byte on, onto the bus. Okay. And with that, I believe we're done with all the functions in this code. Of course, we just modified it. So let's recompile it. And we'll just simply assume that our code is perfect because, you know, that's what you do as a programmer. Now, we can program up something in the Flash and make it go. Now, if you look at the distribution for the Z80 board, you'll see some test apps in there, okay? These are already assembled. Here's your Blinky program. Let's go ahead and um, look at what this thing does. So what's this thing going to do? Uh, we're going to come online. It starts at zero. What are we, what, what are we going to achieve here? We want to flash the LED. It's only got one LED on there, people. It's the SD card uh, select line. All right. You'll notice what I'm going to do is I'm going to load the accumulator with a value with SSEL, which is zero in this line, essentially. Now, I set these other lines so that if there's an SD card plugged into your Z80 retro board, and you should take it out while playing with games like this, this code won't wreck the SD card. All right, it's going to select it and deselect it, and that's okay. But if we just sent random values out there and you plug a, uh, an SD card in, you could, in theory anyway, cause the card to get screwed up and corrupted. So don't put an SD card in your retro board if you're going to send garbage data out the various I.O. ports, which, uh, for all intents and reasons, that's what this thing is doing. Okay? So what are we doing here? We're going to write that value to GPIO out. Then what are we going to do? We're going to put zero in the HL register, and then we're going to count. So what we're going to do is we're going to count up to 64K is what we're going to do just for a delay. This is a delay loop here. Then what are we going to do? We're going to put the same value in the accumulator, but this time SSEL will be a 1. And we're going to write it out to the GPIO output port. We're going to put another delay loop in here. Count up to 64K. When that's done, we're going to go back up to the top of the loop, and we're going to do it again. So this is going to go on, off, on, off with a delay in there. This is your quintessential Blinky program. So let's have a look-see at this IOASM just to drive all the points home here in the same directory. Uh, I just simply blindly included this other file, and in this file there are a bunch of equates that uh, provides us with things like the, uh, the the addresses of the GPIO output port that we want to write to, and it gives us all the pin or the bit numbers for the MOSI clock, SSEL strobe, and the you know all of the, which bits are used for these various things. All right. So why don't we go over there and make sure it's compiled and everything, because who knows, maybe it's an old version or something. All right, so that compiled three different bl Blinky programs. Now we're gonna talk about these in another time. This video is super long as it is. And right now, all we care about is making sure that the Flash programmer works, especially since I uh, just modified the code, right? So here's how I hook up my Raspberry Pi. I got a 40 pin ribbon cable here. Uh, if you don't have one, you can get one. I, I think I stole this one off. Yeah, I sold off of this thing here. One of these Canna Kit T-Bone breadboard thingies, right? That uh, is designed to go on a Pi like this. You can put the 
jumpers and stuff in there or whatever. I just pulled that off and stuck it in here. If you don't have one, you can get either one of these or something like it, or you can just order these cables on Amazon if you want. It looks like uh, some other brands are out there, although nine or 10 bucks seems a little high. I don't know, maybe look at Micro Center or something, or just get some uh, um, uh, um, IDC connectors if you have ribbon cable lying around and throw them in a vise and make some yourself. Anyway, one way or another, grab yourself a 40 pin ribbon header. Uh, I have this jumper in right here. I think it's what, a J3. So this means that the power that's on the Pi over here, nothing's connected otherwise to the retro board. Do not connect power over here at the same time that you've connected power over here if this jumper's in, right? This is how I always use it. Put the jumper in, put the power in here, ribbon cable on there, and run the uh, Flash app. That's how I program my uh, flash chips, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at Blinky. We're gonna flash that LED right there, okay? So this is brand new, fresh and everything. Let's just run blinky one a whopping 29 byte program. Okay, not bad. And uh, we were in here. So what do we wanna do? We wanna run the flash app, reads from standard in, and we wanna go grab Blinky one bin from this directory here, all right? I just did clones for these two projects on my GitHub page from uh, the home my home directory for Raspberry Pi, right? So that's why I can just say tilde slash whatever. And the home directory, this directory slash tests slash blinky one dot bin. You can see it read the product ID, it raised the entire chip, it programs these bytes out, it reads them back in, and it prints them out and hacks as it goes and does a compare on the two and says, did I get back what I wrote in? Yes, it's success. And, of course, if we look over at the bench and we see what took place here, at long last, we see signs of life. <laughs> At which point, any onlooker will be completely dumbfounded at the level of excitement that anyone would have to see a flashing light because they truly have no idea what number of hoops we jumped through to get here and what it really does prove. So sit back and enjoy. Uh, feel free to look at the other uh, Blinky test programs. Uh, they do a couple of different things. Uh, this one just runs out of the flash and blanks the light, as you saw. The other ones will actually uh, engage the SRAM and start interacting with the SRAM and blink it from there and with subroutines and things like that. So uh, it has a stack running and things like that. So uh, you can play around with these. Uh, next time, we'll start talking serious about pro programming the retro board to test out all the ports and stuff and then get moving on creating our bios to fire up cpm so till then thanks for watching see you next time